voice saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them. Now there's a good sign the man got saved. Took them preachers home and fed them. That's what it says, ain't it? As soon as he got saved, brought the preachers home with him and set meat, not vegetables, before them. Amen? That's the word of God. You can't argue with that. Are you saved today? <laughs> I'm just kidding. And rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. I want to preach to you this morning, somebody saved. Now in this story this morning, one of the greatest, probably the most plain illustration of a man just calling on the Lord, being saved by the grace of God, of anywhere in the New Testament. The characters in this story are Paul and Silas. Silas was chosen by the Lord and Paul to go on his missionary journey with him. And they used to go out all over the place preaching. And usually when Paul would go into a city, it wasn't like preachers uh, like we go into now. When the preacher comes to town now, he wonders what the motel will look like, where he'll be staying. Paul didn't look at the Holiday Inn or the Howard Johnson or Econo Lodge or Comfort Inn or even the greasy, uh, uh, you know, the no-tail motel down on the corner. He didn't even look at that. Paul checked out the county jail when he first got to town and said, well, I'll see what kind of quarters I'll be staying in while I'm in this town. That's the way it went with him sometime. And then we see the Roman magistrates, which was a civil officer uh, that was commanded to enforce the law in this story. And, of course, the Philippian jailer, as he's come to be known, who got saved this night because of what happened here in this prison. There's so much in this scripture this morning, there is no way in the world to cover it all. But I will start out by saying this morning that somebody prayed. You'll look back before anybody ever gets saved, there'll be somebody that prays. Somebody said, God does nothing except an answer to people's prayer. And I believe that back by, if you'll trace it back, and if you'll remember when you got saved, you will find out somebody somewhere was praying for you specifically or else praying that you or somebody would win somebody to the Lord. And you this morning and I are the direct result of somebody praying and touching God. Before people get saved, somebody's got to pray. When the church travails and prays, then people will be saved. Now think about this. Think about this setting. Here's Paul and Silas. They were downtown preaching. And they were down there saying, The Lord Jesus Christ is the only way. Prepare to meet God. Boy, these people didn't like it. And there they took them and they said, You're going to hush that stuff up right now. And they said, Oh, no, we're not either. We're going to preach. God's given us a message. We're right and we're going to preach. And they said, Oh, yeah. And boy, they got them and I mean flogged them. And the Bible said they, they, taught, or they ripped their clothes and they beat them. Now, they didn't just throw them in jail. They beat them and laid many stripes on them. Now, think this over with me for a minute. They were in prison. They had blood running out of their back. They had blood running down there. Can you imagine that? I don't know if you've ever been beat like that or not. I, I sure haven't. I guess the closest I ever come to that is having a bicycle wreck. And just getting scabs all over me and blood running down my elbows. And all. One time I was riding this bicycle built for two. Except I was riding it by myself. And I was trying to go in this, turn in, make a turn in this guy's basement. And I turned the rock out and had a wreck. And my arm went down the, down on something was sticking out of the water heater. And it was real sharp. And it ripped my arm all the way down through there. And boy, blood just started running out of it. And I remember I went home with blood running down me. I remember uh, several other times when I'd get scratched, just blood running down your arm. But can you imagine? Can you imagine these guys ripped their shirts off, off their back, and go shh. 
and go like that across their back. Said, you going to preach any more? Yep. You going to preach any more? Yep. You going to preach any more? Yep. Boy, you're a fanatic, ain't you? And he said, I, I sure am. I believe what I'm saying. And boy, they said, do you, you always have to preach about Jesus? And he said, yep, sure do. Pow! You still going to preach about Jesus? Yep, I sure got to preach about him. They said, you're a fanatic, ain't you? And he said, you know what a definition of a fanatic is? And the officer said, no, what is it? And he said, a fanatic is one who can't change his mind and won't change the subject. And he said, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and there's no other way beside him. And if you let us go, we'll preach again tomorrow. And boy, he said, all right, boys, have it your way. Whoosh. And their back looked like that. Right there. After a little while, boy, they were in bad shape. Now, take them in jail, see? Throw them in jail. Lock them. Put stocks in them big steel things. Clamp them down on their ankles. And here sets Paul and Silas like this. See? And they got those things on their hands and on their feet. And there's blood ripping down, sitting on old cold cement, and every once in a while a big old rat probably would run out there and nibble on their toenails or just run around them. And they'd have to kick at them like that. And boy, them rats come out there, blood running off of them boys. Now I'm saying this, I'm saying all this to say this, folks. You ever, most people, everything has to be going just rosy and good before they'll really get, they'll really, you know, they don't want to pray. Listen, they sang praises to God when they were beat and in prison and felt bad and were hurting physically and were in jail and didn't know. Matter of fact, they probably figured they were going to be executed. That's what had happened to Jesus. And they put him in, and apprehended him and then killed him. So Paul and Silas figured, well, I guess they're going to probably kill us. And they prayed and sang praises to God. Now listen, when you can get down in trouble and when everything's going bad and you can still look up and say, praise God, you're God anyway, then you've got something. Amen? Well, you mark these people that the only time they can ever pray or rejoice is when they're in a big happy service and they just got a bonus from, got some money from the IRS that they wasn't supposed to get. And that's the only time they can ever be happy. They ain't got much. But when a lady can have a stack of iron in that high and her back be a hurting and run the iron this way and say, thank you, Jesus, I'm alive, you've got something right there. When a man can go pushing the lawnmower across the yard and sweat dripping off of him and say, hallelujah, I'm saved and I won't have to do this no more in heaven. He's got something, I'll guarantee it. So is it midnight? Oh, Paul and Silas, they were at midnight and they couldn't sleep, son. I mean, can you imagine sleep with blood running out of your back and your arms up like this in stocks and your feet? But somebody prayed. Thank God somebody prayed. They, they had been beaten, but yet they prayed. They they didn't get the poor mouth and start griping to God about how pitiful they were. And they didn't say, God, I, we're living for you, Lord. And, and that preacher on TV said, if we live for you, that we could just name it and claim it. And nothing bad would ever happen to us. And we'd never get sick. And Ezekiel spoke, I, I quoted that verse in Ezekiel. And I didn't quit bleeding. Lord, what's the matter with you? God, what is wrong? God, why, why am I having to suffer like this? God, why are these bad things? happened to me. No, they didn't do that at all. They didn't say good night, Silas. I'm quitting this preaching business. This is for the birds. I'll tell you one thing. God promised to supply my needs and I didn't need this. I'll tell you what. God, they didn't do like this modern day name it, claim it, gab it, grab it uh, gospel that you hear on TV today. They looked over and said, Paul, it, it, Silas said, Paul, isn't it a blessing that we could suffer a little bit and be like Jesus? And Paul said, it sure is, Silas. Why don't we have a word of prayer? And he said, you start us off and then I'll take off when you leave. And boy, Paul bowed his head and he said, Oh, Father, I thank you, Lord, that we've been counted worthy to suffer a little bit for your name. Lord, we're not worthy to even suffer for a great, blessed, holy, wonderful name like yours. But God, I thank you for it. And boy, the Lord was up there in heaven and the Lord started getting a blessing out of that praying. And the Lord started saying, mm -hmm. And boy, the Silas got through praying and Paul prayed and they prayed back and forth and one of them said hey let's sing a song Paul they, he said you 
reckon we should? They said, yeah, all you prisoners down the hall, Jesus saved, Jesus saved. And the jailer's in there playing solitaire, you know, sending out them cards out like this. He said, good night, them fellas, they're crazy. I wouldn't serve a God wind me up in a place like that. Who is this Jesus character? What is this saved business? They don't know what you're talking about, man. Fix me another drink. He's sitting in there like this. And about that time, they started singing. And they sung Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. All right, now, the reason I know all this because I, I know Greek and Hebrew, and you poor, uneducated people don't know it. And anyway, brother, he said, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, and now I see. Hallelujah, it's good to be saved, ain't it, Silas? And Silas said, Amen. And they said, Was grace that taught my heart to fear. Boy, they got on this last verse, and the Lord was up there. He was just getting filled up. And finally, brother, they prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. They prayed and prayed and sang praises unto God. Now let me say this right quickly. There is no place that you can't pray. There is no situation. When you can't do nothing else, you can pray. When you're in pitch black darkness and can't even see to read your Bible, you can pray. When you're laying flat on your back on a hospital bed and being taken into intensive care, you can pray. Brother, you can pray anytime. You can pray anywhere. They didn't have to wait till they got to the synagogue. They prayed and called on God right then. You can pray while you're going down the road going to work. You can pray while you're on your job. You can pray while you're sitting at school, kids. You can pray anywhere about anything. And they didn't gripe. They prayed. I heard about this one old boy. He used to be a preacher friend of mine. And we used to go street preaching with him. And he worked construction. He got him a job up there in Burnsville somewhere working construction. They're just a bunch of regular old hard hat construction workers, you know. And he said every day at lunchtime, when it come time to pray, he didn't mess around. He didn't do like some of you do at work. You know, you bow down and about that time you see the church, you see, and I'll say, oh, well, I better pray. Whew, I don't want these people in here to see me doing that. They'll think I'm weak. So you, you give it one of these numbers. You, know, you scratch your eyebrows. <laughs> or you young. Oh, bless this food on them. That's about the way most people pray at work. Or you might just be so sorry and low down, you just dig right in. I don't know. I saw some folks eating yesterday. And boy, they just sit, the lady come out, set their fish down there, and they just dug right in. Like that little boy staying with them people. And he said, uh, uh, he's staying with these people, and they didn't ask the blessing before they prayed. And that little boy looked up and he said, you're just like my dog. You just start right in. Don't even look up and see where it comes from. Amen. Amen, brother. You better look up and see where that stuff's coming from. And thank God. Well, anyway, my buddy here, he'd get out there and he'd pray. And I mean, he wouldn't get down here and say, Father, have a Father, bless this food in Jesus' name. Amen. He'd get down like this, see, and get out there and say, Father, we thank you for this day. God. Boy, I mean, he'd get with it. And they said before that guy left that job that every day at lunch there's a whole gang of them out there. All of them had their hats off, <laughs> bowing down like that. Everybody was praying. You know what? Things happen when somebody prays. Somebody prayed. Thank God. That before I got saved, there was a lady in Nebo, fasted and prayed six days and nights for the young people in that community. And I looked back after I got saved. I didn't know that until I'd been saved quite a while. I found that out. And I said, thank God somebody prayed. I like somebody prayed for me. They had me on their mind. They sacrificed their time. They fell down on their knees and prayed for me. I'm glad somebody prayed here. Before people get saved, somebody's got to pray. For we'll have people walk the aisle at the youth rally. You know what it's going to take? You say, oh boy, it's youth rally. Automatic good. Good. No, not automatic good. There'll be enough power of the devil in here that night to smoke us out if we don't pray. And if we don't pray, and if we don't pray, that God's power will push out the devil's power. Listen, in a service, you've got a battle going on. And you've got this evil power trying to push in, and you've got God's power trying to push in. You know who wins? The, who, whichever one we yield ourselves to. Whichever one we pray. And you know something, preachers? The battle is already won or lost. 
cross before we get in the pulpit and open the Bible. We've already prayed or we've already lost the battle, one of the two. Thank God somebody prayed. And so they said, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And then we see, secondly, this morning, somebody moved. When after somebody prayed, somebody moved. And guess who it was? It was God. He got to listen to them praying and, and shouting and singing praises up there in heaven. And about that time, the Lord said, Amen! And boy, when he said that, it shook that prison house. There was a great earthquake. God's in charge of earthquakes, you know. He's in charge of how big they are. And boy, that seismograph went up the sun, and that Richter scale got hit. And buddy, all of a sudden, in that jail, that thing just started to do it like this. And everybody said, Lord in mercy, it's been a long time since we had one like that. This ain't even Los Angeles. What's going on here? And that jail started to shake the walls started a rattling and buddy the Bible said the doors flew open and look what it said there in verse number 26 and suddenly, suddenly you know when God moves it's suddenly when God comes on the scene it's just that quick. I've been in services where it seemed dead as 4 o'clock but then suddenly, amen <laughs> suddenly somebody came in, suddenly somebody moved. I've been praying before ain't you? I've been down on my knees praying and it seemed like nothing wouldn't happen happen and then suddenly suddenly that's what happened in the book of Acts chapter 2 suddenly the book said here suddenly there was a great earthquake and once he starts moving in there ain't no stopping it then once that earthquake started it was history then buddy that jail had had it and the Bible said the foundations of the prison were shaken <laughs> like that boy and that thing started shaking like that and the Bible said all the doors were open and the bands were loosed. That's a wild thing, ain't it? All of a sudden it shook and the doors flew open and them things just went, boop, shook them right off their hand. Ain't that wild? How could you shake somebody hard enough to shake them stocks off their feet? The, you know the Lord does some things like that. You know in tornadoes and hurricanes and stuff, they say that sometimes a, uh, that a that a tornado will pick up part of the interstate highway and then there'll be something sitting over here like a bird bath that don't even touch it? I never have figured that out. They've showed pictures. I cannot believe the wind blow hard enough to pick up the interstate highway. But they said it's happened. I know some folks, as a matter of fact, there's, uh, there's uh, some of you here this morning, right out here in West Marion not long ago, where that... The wind, the wind was blowing real hard one night and just took the top off the trailer house. There's people laying there looking up the stars. Wow. Where'd the roof go? That's right. That happened right out here. Isn't that something? And God just went like that and shook and then the stocks fell off and them things and let go and the doors flew open. Somebody moved. God's power. Did you know he showed them he was real? Bible says power belongeth unto God. The doors were open. Everyone's bands were loose. That song we sang a while ago hit the nail on the head. My chains fell off. I tell you, boy, when the Lord moved in that night, he shook Nebo Baptist Church. Matter of fact, he shook Nebo. And buddy, I'll tell you what, everyone's bands were loose. Just fell off. And those things the devil had us wrapped up in all those years just fell off. And I'm telling you, brother, he can shake you too. Don't think God can't shake you. He shook that place to the foundations. He can shake you to your foundations too. Listen, that old boy sitting in here laughing at him, in here playing cards, when that thing started shaking, he shook that boy in his boots. And God Almighty in heaven can shake you too, big boy. You may think, well, I'm young, successful, making a lot of money. I've got this, I've got that. Don't ever doubt God can't shake you. God can shake you. God can grab you and shake you real good. And by the time he gets through shaking you, you'll be wanting to do like this fella did, finding out what you've got to do to be saved. Yes, sir, somebody move. 
moved. He can shake you. I'm glad for that. I'm glad God still moves. I'm glad God still touches services. Somebody moved. But then thirdly this morning, we see that somebody was scared. Somebody was scared. He had no use for them preachers before this, but suddenly he was wondering where the preachers were. The Bible said there in verse 27, 28, 29, and the keeper of the prison, he'd done conked out and went to sleep by this time, waking out of his sleep, seeing the prison doors open, he, he did like this. See, they had already told him. They said, now listen, son, if you let them guys get loose, you know what we're going to do to you, don't you? And he was working night shift here, third shift. And all of a sudden, <clears throat> something shook him out of bed. And he jumped up and he said, Lord, in mercy, what's happened here? And he looked and he saw all them doors open down the hall. And he said, uh-oh, they'll torture me. They'll beat me. They'll flog me and drag me down Main Street and make a spectacle of me. So he pulls out his sword like this. He said, there ain't no hope. My life is over. You know, when, that's, that's when a man's getting ready to get saved when he gets like that. When a man gets to the place where he realizes there's nothing else left, there's nothing else. You show me people that's still happy, satisfied, doing what they want to do, I'll show you a man that's far from God. You show you a man, brother, that's sick of his life, he's sick of his sin, he's just like the prodigal son, he's ready for a change. This old boy pulled out his sword and said, well, this is it. This is it. Life is over. Life's dealt me a bad deal. All the, soul, all the prisoners are escaped, and I'll be dead by tomorrow. I might as well just get it over with and commit suicide. But just in the nick of time, just in the nick of time, the old preacher stuck his head out the window. I'm glad God had, a t had him there for such a time as that. I'm glad God had Paul and Silas right where he wanted. Listen, sometimes things happen to you that you think is something terrible, but it's really not terrible at all. It's it's God working in your life, having you at a certain place for a certain time. You know, some of the things that I've been through, a lot of people say, poor old Danny, look what happened to him. Look what's happened to the church and all that. Brother, listen, God don't make no mistakes. God don't make no mistakes. He allowed things to happen. He allows us to get in the shape we get in so that we can help other people and help people that are struggling. And about that time, Paul stuck his head out one of them cells and said, hold it right there. Do thyself no harm. Don't do it, friend. Don't do it. We're all in here. There ain't a soul left. And the guy went, huh? And that old boy said, am I dreaming? I woke up. The prison house's doors are all open. And the prisoners are still in the cells and ain't even leaving. Something weird's going on around here. Something's happening. Somebody trying to tell me something. We see how that God was working on him. He was scared. He thought about committing suicide. Listen, did you know there's a lot of people? Help me now, mamas. Everybody help me. Did you know there's a lot more people thinks about suicide than we realize? If the truth was known, probably ten times more think about it than actually do it. They say, and if some of them wasn't chicken scared they'd go to hell, there'd be a lot more doing it than they are. I'm telling you this morning, he said there's no other way out. Paul said, yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. Help me now. Help me, mamas. And look what he said. And he called for a light. Smart thing to do, wasn't it? That's what you did the night you got saved. You called for a light. And came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. Now, one quick thing here before I give you the last point. This fellow who got saved here had no use for them preachers until this happened. You may, you may be sitting here this morning saying, I wish my mama and daddy wouldn't make me come and listen to him, screaming and hollering at me every Sunday. That's all he does. Scream at me. Get saved. Get saved. Get saved. Well, I want to tell you something this morning. The day will come when you're going to look for somebody to tell you how you can get saved. Hey, he wouldn't give them preachers the time of day right before this, but he's in there falling down in front. That's why you should never give up on anybody, folks. 
That's why you should never give up. Just because you visit them and they cuss you out and tell you to go on, they're playing solitaire, drinking liquor, don't give up. God can shake them to their foundation. God can shake them real good and they'll come in one of these days and fall down before you and say, boy, what must I do to be saved? So lastly and fourthly this evening or this morning we see somebody saved. If I don't hush, it'll be this evening. Somebody saved. Somebody saved. We see that somebody prayed and then we see that somebody moved. We see that somebody got saved scared, and then thank God somebody got saved. He asked the famous question, the most famous question of all time, the most important question of all mankind, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Oh, how that question has been asked and abused down through the years. And thank God he asked the right kind of preacher. Lord, in mercy, if he had asked a Catholic priest that, would he ever been into a mess? Oh, if he had asked a water dog that, would he have ever been in a mess. Oh, I'm glad he has the right kind of preacher. That's why we ought to know what we believe. That's why we ought to know what, what we stand on. Because their souls come seeking to us saying, Sir, what must I do to be saved? I'm glad Paul didn't look at him and say, All right, sir, now we're going to start you off in confirmation classes. And by the time you pass all the seven steps and everything in several weeks, we'll be able to have you fixed up. And then if you'll hang on and do the best you can and be faithful to the church and give us a bunch of money, you'll be saved. Paul didn't say that. Paul didn't look at him and say, all right, sir, first thing I got to do is put you in some water. And ain't no water around here, so you can't get saved in here. We got to go out here somewhere. Paul didn't say that. I'm glad Paul didn't say, well, listen, friend, repent, believe, be baptized, turn from your sins, wait about six months, see if you live it, and then we'll see if you can make it in. He didn't say that at all. Paul gave him the great straight answer. He said, believe on the Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Listen, if you would ever get that through your mind, you would never doubt your salvation again. God said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Have you got that this morning? He didn't say go by your feelings. God Almighty didn't say go by a certain lifestyle that you live. God didn't say live up to a certain standard. He said, Jesus Christ has paid the price for your sins. If you believe on him, you're saved. And that's it. A lady was talking to Charles Spurgeon one time. I believe it was a, a, a lady and she was confused. She couldn't believe. She couldn't believe that she was saved. She was always doubting. He said, all right, ma'am, look here what the Bible says. Accept him. Believe on him. You're not under condemnation. You pass from death and life. You believe that? She said, yes. And he said, well, are you saved? And she said, I'm not sure. He said, look here what the Bible said. If you believe on him, you're passed from death and life. No condemnation. You're saved. He said, you believe that? And she said, yeah. He said, well, are you saved? She said, I still doubt it. And boy, she said his eyes flashed at her, and he got mad kind of and said, see here, who are you doubting? Who are you calling a liar here? And boy, she got scared, and she said, I see it. I see it. I believe on him, and I'm saved. Let me tell you something, brother. There was an old preacher that lived 50 years for God. Preached nearly 50 years. And the man loved God with all of his heart. He was laying on his deathbed. And his son knelt before him and said, Dad, he said, I know you're going to heaven. He said, nobody's done as much good as you have. You've preached, you've lived right all these many, many years. And the daddy looked back at him and he said, Son, don't talk about that. I don't want to hear it. Talk to me about the blood of Jesus. He said, it's only the blood of Jesus that'll do for a dying man. Brother, listen, that man had his hope right. You know the reason people doubt their salvation? Because they're dependent on the life they're living rather than what the Lord Jesus Christ did for them on the cross. They're not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. They think, well, I must not be saved because I wouldn't be doing like I'm doing and I'm sinning and if I was saved, I wouldn't be sinning like this. Brother, you'll never have assurance if you're depending on a life, the certain kind of life that you're living. You never will be sure you're saved. You go to a church where they teach you that you have to live up to a certain standard to be saved or stay saved you'll never be able to enjoy it because you don't never know if you've done enough. And every one of them has their own standards of how much you've got to do. Amen! Many years ago in a rock gallery, 
These fellows were guards, and there was two of them out here marching back and forth like this. And one of them had the peace of God in his heart and the assurance of his salvation. And the other one was seeking. And he kept trying to find peace with God and couldn't find it. And so one of them was walking back and forth, and he's meditating on the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. Oh, how precious is the blood of Jesus. Oh, I know I'm saved because of the blood. Praise the Lord, I'm saved because of the blood. And the other one was going, man, I don't know if I can make it or not. I don't know if I'm going to heaven or not. Man, I don't know if I've done enough good or not. I don't know if God will accept me or not. And this guy walked in, this officer walked in and stopped this Christian boy just as a checkpoint and said, Hey, son, give me the password for being in the rock gallery. And the Christian wasn't even thinking, and before he even thought, he said, The blood of Jesus! And then he realized he had messed up and gave him the real password. But when he said the password was the blood of Jesus, that voice carried down that hallway and it went in that other fellow's ears and he said it was just like an angel from heaven spoke to me and said, there's the password, the blood of Jesus. I'm worthy, but we're saved by his blood. And boy, that old boy got that night and he said, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, you get saved the same way I did. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he got saved. Listen, if you're here this morning and you're not saved, I'll tell you how you can be saved and go to heaven. Here's what you do. If you will completely trust the Lord Jesus Christ, completely trust Him, you have absolute positive assurance from God Almighty that you'll go to heaven when you die. Did you know that's why it's so hard for a lot of young people to stay in church and stay right with God? Because they don't really know they're saved. And they say, you mean I'm giving up all my friends and all my fun and everything for something that I don't even know if I've got it or not? And they give up too easy. You know why they give up too easy? Their hope and their faith is not in the right place. If it ever dawns on you that if you've trusted Him with your soul, you're in. You can get up, boy, and he took a preacher's home. He said, honey... Look who I brought home with me. Two preachers. She said, huh? IRS get you or something? He said, no. He said, I'm saved. And boy, it blew her mind and she got saved and the young ones got saved and salvation come to that fellow. Somebody got saved. You know what the great thing is this morning? Somebody can get saved here today. Somebody here today could get saved. It could be you. This is your lucky day. <laughs> Amen. God wants to save you today. This could be the day when the Lord Jesus Christ comes into your heart. If you'll walk down this aisle this morning, bow on your knees as a sinner, and say, Dear God, I know I'm a sinner, and I need to be saved. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you do it, let's stand and bow. Every head bowed, every eye closed. While they get us a song, Christians are praying this morning. There may be somebody here this morning, right there where you stand. You know God's spoken to your heart. Now, is there somebody here this morning, say, Preacher, I sound like that man in the story you were telling this morning. I believe that I'm just like the guy in the, in the jail. I'm not saved. You know what we're doing? We're praying. Christians are praying right now that God will move through here and that you'll be saved. How long are you going to wait? What are you waiting on? Are you just going to keep on waiting and waiting and waiting forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? Huh? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? you just going to walk out here this morning and say, well, maybe some other time? Or are you going to let...